All right, now we got to talk about the um, the trap and roll, the upa, the sort of the escape that you most commonly see taught for the mount. Uh, if you uh, haven't seen it, it looks something like this. There's some slightly different variations of it, but basically you're trapping an arm, you're trapping an ankle, you're bridging, and you're rolling somebody over. Uh, certainly don't want to suggest that this escape doesn't work, uh, but it's quite difficult to achieve for you know beginners. It's it's not uh, it's, it's weird. We we think this is like the last escape you should learn. Yeah. And most people teach it as like the first escape you should learn. Um, Everyone sees it coming. Yeah, it, it's a very predictable escape. It, it does to a certain degree rely on, you know, we talk about what works against beginners, what works against more advanced people. The, I think the reason this is taught is because it can work quite well against beginners. And so it gives you kind of, kind of a false sense of confidence. And I guess, yeah, someone like, if we're looking at like a self-defense quick thing to try and like just trap one side of the body and roll, it's like most yeah. idiots just fall over. Yeah, but like, you know, if you're learning jujitsu, most idiots shouldn't be able to mount you. Uh, and so it's kind of a weird, like, uh, yeah, um, it's a bit of a paradox. This escape does work at the high level. It, it's just that the timing necessary and the level of error necessary for it to work is quite a bit higher. So we like to show people stuff that, you know, A, works very well at the low level, but also works very well at the high level. And this is not an escape you see executed. We're not saying never. I'm sure there's going to be somebody in the YouTube comments here with, you know, uh, um, Kieran Gracie did this to Andre Galvao. Like, yes, people do get rolled every so often, but that usually happens when somebody's being, you know, quite a bit too aggressive, you know, or somebody was stalling for an entire 20 minute match and then the other opponent, anyway. Um, this escape does work. These are the reasons we don't use it. It's because the, the level that, uh, the level of opponent really dictates how reliable this escape is. Um, let's just go through it. One of the reasons it's an issue is you're gonna have people try like, if you look at Rory's alignment right now, it's pretty good. And he's got good structure, he's got good posture. If you look at my alignment, what's about to happen when I try to wrap his arm up, is I'm extending, ah, oh, damn it. I'm extending my own structure. Thanks for the underhook, fuck face. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's really what you're liable to have happen. Uh, even if I'm trying to like knee him in the butt and bridge and get his weight way forward, because his weight's already in his hands, if I start extending my arm, I've given him a you very- You shouldn't even be able to break my arm yeah, from like, here anyway. Yeah, so like for this to work, and then again, we're not saying it can't. Like for instance, if you go back to side control for a second, where, uh, on this side, where you will see this work is if Rory doesn't do the necessary work of breaking my alignment, so he hasn't broken my posture, and he took a really shallow underhook and didn't break my alignment. Yeah, that's already pinned. This is the time, and I do believe this is how Huron did it to Andre Delmel. Right? Um, that's the time and that's the context in which I think this escape should be taught. Not you've been fully mounted, let's go ahead and try to wrap someone's arm up and, and flip them to one side, but as a preemptive, somebody starting to mount you, you manage to time their center of gravity shift as it goes over my hips and I don't have my posture broken. Uh, I'm able to trap his elbow. I'm even able to sometimes like catch his knee so he can't complete the turn and I can take him over. But, you know, as you deal with more experienced people, as he walks this underhook up and cross faces me, and I try to do a trap and roll escape, I'm just bringing him into a really good mount. So even then, you have to be really, really watchful for how you apply it, because you're taking a risk by extending your arm out rather than closing your structure uh, and making it more, uh, you know, structurally sound. The other way that I like to use it is it's kind of a way of me threatening, uh, trying to punish somebody when they're giving their hands closer to me, uh, where I'm able to control them. Because as I'm trying to do this framing, if someone's trying to grab the collar or if they're trying to get their arms, like typically someone's gonna be trying to work to get that elbow up underneath their leg. So as I'm here, if Rob's trying to get this arm out, and I might be like, man, I don't quite feel like I can frame and hip escape from here. But if I'm able to grab the back of his tricep and start controlling here, that now, because I've already turned, my foot can already start blocking this, I might be able to, from here, just be able to bridge and actually knock him. But so that's a context in which, yeah. because of your superior structure and me overextending yeah. my elbow to try to uh, fix the alignment equation, I, he's waited for a vulnerability in my alignment and he's exposed and attacked it. 
But I'm honestly not expecting to do this. This is just like that jab, kind of like that reversal of the center of gravity where it's like, I'm just expecting to do this. And then as Rob starts to pull his arm out, I'm like, <laughs> I got that arm out of there because yeah. I didn't like it. It was causing a problem. <laughs> and one thing I'll just touch upon there because I've still had higher belts, so even brown belts do it. If I reach over too greedily at that arm and I lose that frame on that other side, I can give up my back just trying to go for that bridge and roll. So uh, be very careful with how you're traveling on. That's where like that. An overhook is not realistic, but it's definitely safer. But as the other arm comes over to look for more two-on-one style forms of control, which I think is better, you have to just be more careful about that range and how much you're turning yourself and possibly giving up your back. Yeah, exactly. So just like any of the other escapes, this exists in the context of if the circumstances are right, try it, but don't expect it to work by itself. Try it so that you draw a response that allows you to plug in one of the other escapes. It's just, again, we think this one of the, of the four is kind of the least useful, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. It just means that once you learn the other ones, you'll be able to create more of a context. Like if I want to hit a trap and roll, and I know how to create a good solid like bridge and bump, that's an opportunity where I could hit it. All right? Because of how high up I got Rory's arm shifted, uh, I may be able to like buckle it this way or if his weight is really in his hands and he doesn't post too far forward He just yes yeah, stays here yeah. as I lift. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, that created the context So it, again, it, it does have its place But just do not be the, the person who's reaching up like this to try to wrap someone's arm up It's not great and we do find that that's kind of the, the biggest limitation to it as, as a beginner you tend to get the broad strokes and less the important details. The broad strokes of framing the hips and, and doing this, we find people can pick up quite easily. The broad stroke or the, you know, the subtle details of making the trap and roll escape are a little bit above. And honestly, just even blocking the entire side of my body, as long as I don't keep my center of gravity completely stacked on top of Rob, I don't really care. Like I'll, I'll laugh at lower belts. I mean, if there's a certain strength, then I have to be super concerned. But it's like the idea is Rob to block the left side of my body. And so with my center of gravity right on top of him, where you can see my left shoulder is on top of his right shoulder, if he bridges right now, then yeah, I'm moving. But as soon as like that happens, if I just go off to the side or oh, here, and God. especially if I know how to use hooks, I'm like, come on, Rob. Come on. Yeah, so again, like I think we've probably shit on this enough. It, probably more than we wanted to. This is a functional escape. I use it all the time, but it's, once again, it's timed well, like, yeah, like I, I hit you with a bridge and roll like I think the other day or something, but it was like we were coming out of a big scramble and there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened and it was well timed. Uh, I'm not gonna ever do that once you're in mount and you've solidified. That's yourself. exactly it. Whereas you know, and in, in, in rolling, you and I both hit the frame and hit all the skip one all the time on each other on other black belts. Uh, yeah, like that that trap and roll. I was like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> well done. But it's also like the one time that it's happened in like a year or two. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the lowest percentage of the realistic, effective mount escapes.